Good Friday morning. It's going to be a little different this morning. Turns out we are doing the grand house. So just to make it official, Hunter Kaur, co-chief resident. Manish Padward, co-chief resident, ECU Internal Medicine. All right. And once again, welcome you all to the grand house. So what are we talking about this morning? The evolution of technology in resident medical education in 2011 and beyond. We do not have any disclosures. And if we haven't made it obvious yet, our inspiration, Charles, this invitation is a from our family. Thank you. Thanks, Ray. Applause anytime. Oh, and guys, uh, med students, attendings alike, uh, you can tweet Grand Rounds, please. Because this is what it's all about. So taking a leaf out of Mr. Jobs' inspiration, we are going to promote our product just like Mr. Jobs. So our objectives for the day. So today we're going to summarize the evolution of technology used in medical uh, resident education at East Carolina University. We want to launch the latest addition to our educational arsenal today, and we're going to discuss the strengths and limitations of the technology that we're using, and then we're going to accept questions from you guys. Okay, so let's get started here. So we're going to talk about what we've done in ECU Internal Medicine Residency Program to incorporate technology and social media into medical education. So we started with Facebook in 2011. It was about six to seven years after a lot of people had started using Facebook for uh, keeping in touch with friends, family, or social media. But we started using it for a bit more than that, a bit of education as well. So how did we use uh, Facebook? Well, first off, we have a Facebook profile for the Chiefs, as well as a Facebook page for the Internal Medicine Residency Program. And through both of those, we were able to upload schedules uh, upload announcements, updates for the residency program. We promoted our activities, posted pictures of our interns during orientation. Uh, we just use it to connect with residents, prospective residents, our incoming residents, and uh, the medical students throughout ECU. Okay. So this was started in 2011 by Alex Amira, yes. Jennifer Foster, and Daphne Heinken, our chiefs, uh, two years ago. And just a snapshot of our Facebook page. So, um, as you can see, we've got 209 friends and 179 likes. Uh, of those friends, only 44 are non-ECU friends. Uh, of the 179 likes on our page, 59 of those are friends of ECU IM, which means that we are reaching out to other folks that are not friends with ECU and they are they may or may not be outside of Greenville. So just for those who are not very familiar with Facebook, all those friends and all those people who have liked our page, our updates appear in their news feed. So whatever we are updating on our Facebook appears on their page daily. So it's, it's a way for us to reach out to all those prospective residents as well as current residents, as well as faculty and friends. Moving on, July 2012, we started Twitter. It was started by Azim Lahi and Reed Friend, our chiefs from the last year. On Twitter, we have our handle as ECUIM Chiefs, which is similar to a profile on Facebook. And hashtag ECUIMRES, what it means is it is a subject. So every tweet posted under hashtag ECUIMRES will appear as uh, any update under the subject of ECUIMRES. For example, hashtag Sociologics. So anything tweeted throughout the world under the hashtag Sociolympics, we'll talk about Sociolympics and will appear in that update. So the hashtag is also like our internal medicine residency page on Facebook. So how do we use Twitter? Well, again, we use it for education. Uh, we try to tweet, noon report, grand rounds, as well as our Friday conference series. We use it for residency updates, uh, kudos to the residents, important messages. Uh, past few days, we've had some terrible weather, so we've tried to keep in touch with the residents a little bit uh, through that. And another uh, reason to use Twitter is residency recruitment. And this is something you'll start noticing as a common theme across all social media is we are using it for residency recruitment. At this time, we are, it's too early for us to have any data on that, but hopefully down the road we'll have some data on how it is helping us 
are not helping us in residency recruitment. So just a snapshot of our Twitter page. So uh, as you can see, you can uh, see the tweets that we send out. Uh, you are able to post video and photos to Twitter as well as uh, tweets. Uh, tweets consist of about 140 characters, so you only got a short amount of uh, space to get out uh, educational information. Uh, from this, you can see that we've sent out uh, roughly about 2,000 tweets, and we have about 300 followers. So our followers are folks that will see everything that we tweet. So these are just examples of how good tweets are. So Dr. Garrison, uh, Mashan News, ECU Internal Medicine, we are putting the hashtag as I am conference. So everything throughout the United States under I am conference uh, appears under that hashtag. So there are various residency programs that talk about their conferences under hashtag I am conferences. So all that information is followed under that hashtag. Similarly, ECUM RES is our own hashtag, and FOA Med is also an open access source for medical education. So I know this slide looks really busy, um, but it's actually fairly simple. All the circles that you see are people who are receiving tweets uh, from us. Uh, the circles are people who are outside of ECU, where the red triangles, which are a little harder to see, are ECU folks. The purple is Dr. Desai at Neph on Demand. Blue is us at ECU IM Chiefs. The Yellow golden color is Dr. Kramer at uh, SKPD ECU IM. Uh, and what this means is if ECU IM chiefs were to send out one tweet, it takes two people to retweet that to uh, get the message across to a large number of people. So we all know about number needed to treat, right? And NT. We're going to call it number needed to tweet. <laughs> so we don't exactly have a formula for that. But the concept is the same, that lesser number of feeds to spread the message to more number of people. So lesser the number, better it is. We are at two right now. Okay. All right. And this is just a uh, map of where some of our Facebook followers are. So as you can see, the majority of them right now are in North Carolina. Uh, we've got a few in uh, New York, Pennsylvania, a couple in Ohio, uh, a few out in California. So what it means is all those followers that we send a message out is reaching those people and also the followers of these handles. So it gets multiplicated to various number of, uh, or large number of audience. So modest numbers, I know, people are not impressed. But let's move on. Let's talk about YouTube. So we talked about Facebook, we talked about Twitter. Then we talked about, then we launched YouTube. So Almost everyone in this room has used YouTube at some point to view the video or maybe up upload a video. But most of the residency programs or hospitals use YouTube to promote their hospital. So you have a video from a reputed hospital talking about a new procedure that they've started at their hospital or a new building that they have uh, built. So essentially to promote their hospital or their program. But we started using YouTube a bit differently. We used it to spread medical education. All these grand rounds, all these conferences, and all the medical information that gets spread within the ECU internal medicine can go on YouTube and reach larger audience. And we'll know a bit more about that in further slides. So like I said, all these grand rounds, including, including this grand round, and FII, we talk to, we take the consent of the speaker uh, who's presenting at grand round if it is okay for them to uh, upload this video on YouTube, similarly for Friday conference lectures. And after that, those lectures go on YouTube. Uh, so essentially promotion, but in a different way than most other programs seem to do it. We're spreading medical education and making it an open access source for medical education. And again, the common theme remains residency recruitment. And not only is it just for our residency uh, program here, but thanks to Dr. Mark Romans and Dr. Paul Bowen, uh, we are getting uh, the region uh, docs involved in this. So they're getting a chance to see our grand rounds, uh, even though they are not able to be here physically. Uh, so here's just a picture of our YouTube channel. Uh, as you can see, we've got quite a few um, videos posted. This is not all of them. Uh, we have about 41 videos. Uh, 
currently we have about 346 subscribers. Uh, basically that means that everybody that subscribes to us, whenever we upload a video, they get that in their news feed on YouTube. Uh, we've posted about 41 videos, which averages out to about 38 hours of education posted on YouTube. Of that 38 hours, we're getting out about 2,000 hours of education being delivered to folks because we're getting about 21,000 views on these 41 videos. So I just want to take a moment here and to assimilate those numbers. What do those numbers really mean? So we are posting about 38 hours of education, educational videos that are being viewed for over 2,000 hours and 20, over 20,000 times. So what does 20,000 views mean? Does it mean 20,000 different people are viewing it? Maybe not. I watch a video once, I log out, I log back in, it gets counted as two views, but it's the same person. But what important it is, so for any grand rounds, how many, how many people in the audience? Maybe 60, 70? So any ECU Intel Medicine Grand Rounds that gets attended by 60 or 70 people is now being followed by over 20,000 times and we don't know how many viewers, but it's being seen for 2,000 hours. Education about 38 hours being seen over 2,000 hours. And that's something we wanted to assimilate those numbers and really understand what those numbers mean. And where are these videos being seen? Is it only in the United States? Is it only in Greenland, North Carolina? What do you think, Hunter? Actually, it's not. Um, it's, uh, it really is a little tough to see on this map, but the darker the blue, the more views. So, of course, uh, top of the list is the United States. Number two is going to be India, um, <laughs> with actually a little over 1,300 views uh, itself. Next comes the United Kingdom, then Canada, and finally Australia. But we have 92 countries that our videos are being viewed in. We even have 101 views in Russia. So Grand Rounds and Friday Conferences at ECU Internal Medicine in Greenville, North Carolina is being viewed all over the world in over 92 countries. How about in the US? Well, you would think that North Carolina is top, but it's not. Actually, Ohio has the most views. Currently, they've got a little over 1,100 views. Next comes California. Uh, they're right at 1,100. North Carolina comes in third. New York, fourth, and Florida is fifth. So all these videos and all this information is not limited to our program, it's not limited to ECU, but it's going to different countries, different states, and a lot of medical students, medical residents, faculty alike are watching these videos and getting the message that is being sent out from ECU Internal Medicine. So prior to residency, uh, we took a little survey and about 83% of the residents were using Facebook prior to coming to residency. And only about 13% were using Twitter prior to residency. However, after being here, uh, we've got a slight bump in the users in Facebook uh, among the residency, so we're up to about 88%. However, Twitter had a large increase thanks to uh, Reed Friend and Azim Alahi. Uh, we now have 48% of our residency uh, residents on Twitter at this time. So, uh, as we talked earlier, there are a lot of uh, residency programs using social media. Um, several folks are using YouTube, as you can see. Uh, Mayo Clinic, Einstein College of Medicine, Johns Hopkins Bayview as well as Florida, uh, University of Florida International. Uh, some of the folks that are on Twitter uh, include these uh, followers that we have and we follow them. Uh, Jefferson Medicine, the University of Chicago uh, Internal Medicine Residency Program, University of Nebraska uh, Medicine Residency, as well as here in our own state, New Hanover Regional Medical Center. So now residents are using social media, right? Residents are using Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, now those who are post call or those who are off or vacation are able to see those videos even if they're not able to attend the Friday conferences and grand rounds. So you got Facebook, you got YouTube, we got Twitter. And most of the residents have smartphones. They're using smartphones to access different uh, medical education resources, including the ones that we mentioned. So how about we put Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and add a few more logistics in there. 
and have that on your smartphone. So what are we talking about? Any ideas, any thoughts? All right, it's our pleasure to introduce you to our latest addition to our arsenal, ECU Digital Medicine app. Now available on iTunes. <laughs> Android users will have to wait for some time, sorry guys. So all those, all those Apple users in-house, get your iPhones, your tablets out, and you can download it right now, and we can walk you through how to use this app. So is everyone ready? All right, let's do this. All right. So this is just a snapshot of our app, so you can type in ECUIN in your search box. You'll be able to pull up the app. I'm gonna give you a couple seconds, couple minutes to do that. I'm just gonna get his phone connected so that he can have real time teaching about this app. Go ahead. So what's this app all about? So like it says in the description, you're using this residency app uh, for house staff to be able to access certain information that they need <coughs> for their daily workflow. Uh, a lot of logistics, like we said, conference schedules, uh, you know, their own block schedules, and also all the education resources that we talked about in covering social media. What I want to emphasize here, and I will emphasize it even later on, that this is not replacing the traditional teaching of medicine, but it's only supplementing the traditional teaching. And it's finding a way for that message to reach larger and larger audiences. So is everyone ready? Shall we go ahead with the app? Mo uh, All right. Okay. So to um, unlock the protected content in this application, uh, you're going to need to put in a username. Doesn't matter. You can use your ECU uh, email address. The password for today and today only is on the screen. It's lowercase ecu exclamation mark m 8411 and that will only work for today and the reason for password is we want to protect the sensitive information like resident pages attending pages so on and so forth uh, and that's the reason these uh, numbers phone numbers and page numbers are protected by this password everything else is available to the public okay all right so let's get started all right let's take a look at the app so this is how you would see the app on your screens. As you see, we have different options here. It's a link to our residency web page. There's a link to schedules, conferences, some cheat sheets that residents find useful on floors, internal survival guide, just some logistics, resident pagers, attending pagers, certain important BMC numbers, antimicrobial guide. We have to uh, thank Dr. Cook is here uh, and Mr. Gooch and the entire uh, ID department and by the medical center for giving us access to this uh, antimicrobial guide. The antimicrobial guide that you've used in your pockets, in your coat pockets, that's on, now on your phones. You also have the Diabetes Blue Book. Dr. Tannenberg is here. Thank you so much, Dr. Tannenberg, for giving us the opportunity to have this access made, made available to the residents on their phones. Uh, we have Nephrology on Demand. Dr. Desai has been a mentor around, uh, for this entire project, and there's a link to Neph on Demand in there. There's a link to this new app developed by Tindu and Brazil. Cardiac Risk Assist. It lets you calculate your uh, lipid goals for your patient and lots of new links through that. And Cardiac Risk Assist, uh, we have a link for that app on here as well. We also have a link to survey. And a link to all the Facebook, Twitters, and YouTube down here. So let's look at one of these. So let's see, what, what do the schedules show, Hunter? So currently we have uh, our general medicine call schedule. Uh, quite a large file now that uh, we've added a few new schedules to it. Uh, so even though it's on wireless, it will take a minute for it to come up. Uh, but we have our general medicine call schedule. We have uh, cardiology and we have MICU in here as well. Uh, so whenever uh, residents need to know whether they're gonna be on nights in the MICU coming up or nights on cardiology they can open this up 
and uh, take a look at it. We went into open stuff, that is. It's yeah. a cold morning. So someone asked me the other day, so schedules change, some calls get switched. How do we keep up with this? How do we know who's switching the call with who? And I said in last Friday conference, wait for one week, there may be a way to have that available on your phones. And this is the way it does download. I'm not sure if it's downloading on your phones. It's been working fine on all our phones. I'm not quite sure. It is downloading. Perfect. Thank you, sir. Yeah, I did. Okay. There, there we go. go. There we go. And you can increase it in size. So this is the most updated block schedule, uh, the calls, cardiology schedule, micro schedule. So you know, day-to-day -day information that all the residents need to know when they're working, when someone else is working, uh, who, do, who do they need to sign out to. So some logistics. Similarly, we have schedules for conferences. Uh, the Friday conferences are uh, noon report schedule as well. And you can get that through the AM conference uh, right there. Okay. All right. uh, let's take a look at antimicrobial guide. So I'm sure all of you have used this at some point with the actual book. How, how about if we had that available on your phone and in a searchable manner? So if you want to look up UTI, just type in UTI in search box and UTI will put up. So we've got, uh, we actually have all of the sections, so you can uh, actually take a look at everything and quickly go to what you're searching for. Let's go back. And similarly, the diabetes blue book for management of inpatient hyperglycemia and hypoglycemia, and this is all available on your phones now. Okay. Going back. All right, our interns. You remember the survival guide that was given uh, at the beginning of the year. How many of you guys still have that in your coat pockets? You got one? Mm. All right, well, guess what? Now you've got it on your phone. So now if uh, you saw something in the intern survival guide that you liked that, uh, and you just happened to lose your survival guide, now you have it on your phone, right. uh, and you can quickly scroll through and find what you're looking for. Mm -hmm. All right. And also links to the NEF on demand and cardiac risk assist uh, yes. apps as well. And these are all fully functional apps that have like on our uh, app as well. So now you're rounding. Uh, it's eleven o'clock. <laughs> you are seeing a patient in two south, and. Uh, there's a question that you had for, say, one of the Hemong fellows. And Hemong team has rounded the day before, uh, or maybe one of the IT fellows. And now you have a question that you want to ask them, and you want to page them. But guess what? You got to finish seeing patients on two and you got to run to MIU. Uh, and you are physically going to have to stay <coughs> next to a phone while you page them, and while the fellow answers the uh, page back, and then you talk to them. Well, how about you could do that from your phone? Can we do that? Let's try. All right. Let's try paging. What do we want to page? Let's page Harun. Okay. Should be right on top. At home, please make sure the page is not. Good job, Varun. <laughs> 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 Alright, let's try page number two. Uh, actually, let's try page number one. Okay. And there's 10. All right. Okay, we want to call someone. We want to call, uh, let's see, we have, or we want to page or call a number in the hospital. Maybe we are, who do we want to call that doesn't get annoyed at us if we call, it, call them right now? Let's see.
How about the three page, the education office? Or call the education office? Let's see. Yeah, we'll just call to self. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, there we go. Hey, Lucy, it's Dr. Core. We, uh, good morning. We just wanted to uh, try out something. Uh, so we've got you talking to uh, our Grand Rounds folks this morning, uh, just previewing a uh, new application that we're using. Could you tell everyone good morning? <laughs> yeah, that's fine. All right. Thank you, Lucy. Thanks, Lucy. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, so you get that. So you can hate someone, you can call someone when you're on the move. Uh, also, let's see if we can pull up our YouTube page from here. Let's go back and do it one more time. Actually, let's pull up Facebook. There we go. Okay, it's our Facebook page. And link to our Facebook page and everything that you see on the page, you can have a great link on this app. Also, you can open up the YouTube channel yep. and uh, view all the videos, that, more than 40 videos that we have uploaded so far, uh, and access to all those videos on your phone. All right? Dermatology grand rounds from last week. Uh, last week. Uh, Philips. And it's up here. So is uh, some of the previous grand rounds. Okay. All right? All right. So we got the gist, right? So everybody has the app on their phones now? Okay, good. Well, and I see that we've gotten one new like on the Facebook page since uh, <laughs> last night. <laughs> All right. All right. So a little bit about the data that we have so far. Stop. Okay. <laughs> All right, uh, as of February 3rd, we had about 73 people actually install the application. Uh, a little odd, but uh, we know that uh, Tim Nguyen, Dr. Desai, ourselves, and Dr. Kramer had downloaded the app. We had a few folks from uh, several other areas download the application. Uh, <clears throat> it has been used 198 times. 144 of that 198 times was within the United States, 129 times from North Carolina, and as you can see, 125 uh, from Greenville, uh, which pretty much accounts for myself, Manish, and Dr. Desai and Dr. Kramer. And every user, when they go onto this app, are spending about roughly eight, eight and a half minutes, so it's not logging in and logging back out, but maybe going onto the YouTube link and watching the videos. So again, making the YouTube video reachable to more and more audiences. So what are what are the lessons learned from here, and what are the what are the pitfalls maybe, and what are the advantages? So uh, all of our residents know about social media, but uh, some of the newer forms of social media, including Twitter, uh, our residents are a little hesitant to use. So it takes uh, quite a bit of encouragement from us to get our residents to use uh, social media, uh, Facebook and Twitter. Uh, time investment. Time investment can be small uh, for Facebook and Twitter, or it can be uh, much a little more time consuming uh, for YouTube because you have to uh, record the videos, you have to produce them and share them and upload them to YouTube. For Twitter, we found that uh, for conferences, you need at least one assigned tweeter uh, for that. And for most of our conferences, it's uh, either myself or Manish. Uh, using the uh, ECU IM Chiefs uh, handle. You don't want to overtweet things. So, typically, uh, within a 30 to 60 minute lecture, you want to try to get out maybe 5 to 10 pearls. Um, and those pearls have to be within 140 characters. 
So you don't want to sit there and tweet 20 or 30 uh, things from one conference. Uh, some things you can do that with uh, because you actually have to. Noon Report is a good example of that. Um, it's hard to get the pertinent information out uh, on Noon Report in 140 characters. But you can also use video, you can also use uh, photographs uh, through Twitter. We know that uh, the new forms of uh, education that we're using, the social media, it doesn't replace traditional uh, medical education bedside rounding. This is only used to supplement education. And that's what we want to uh, make you guys realize that this is just a supplement. It's not to replace anything. Absolutely. And to end it all, we have a lot of uh, people that we need to thank. Dr. Kramer, this is the only exception. <laughs> You're darn right about that. Yep. We did ask permission first. <laughs> and this is going to change when we go back on the course. Yeah. So. All right, Dr. Boland, uh, I don't think Dr. Boland's here today, but without his support, we wouldn't have been able to do all these uh, social media advances in education, and thank you for his uh, support throughout this project. He was, he was also able to find the funding to get us the nice laptop to be able to make our recordings on. Absolutely. Uh, Dr. Azim Lai, a great friend, uh, who started our uh, Facebook, uh, our, our Twitter. Twitter in 2012, Daphne Harrington, Alex Mera, Jen Foster started the Twitter, and Zoom and Kolugar and Todd Lineberry started recording all these videos three years ago, and that's the reason why we've been able to upload all these videos now on YouTube. And we cannot end this without thanking Dr. Desai, has been our mentor through all this project, and thank you very much, Dr. Desai, and everyone involved in the technical uh, aspects of it, including Tim Nguyen, uh, uh, Hunter, Dr. Kramer, Dr. Desai, and myself. I want to thank you all. There also want to take this opportunity to thank all the previous chief residents at ECU School of Medicine who started this president of education uh, and we've just taken it beyond the, our classrooms and hoping to send this message out to larger and larger audience. And with this, uh, we're ready to take your questions. Thank you, everyone. Absolutely, and I will say that uh, Dr. Bolin and uh, we have been trying to come up with a way to uh, get the uh, CME credit for Grand Rounds, uh, for those who can view Grand Rounds, uh, and we would like to push that towards, uh, you know, uh, maybe doing some more stuff with the app to be able to uh, get CME credit. Twitter to get more and more medical information. Uh, imagine if patients had more reliable sources of that information rather than 
uh, something that's not regulated, if, what if it came from their doctor? Without uh, violating HIPAA, uh, if patients, many of the patients are getting more and more tech savvy, uh, if we can have this resource available to them, that will be uh, good for their overall, uh, just educating them about their own medical problems and so on and so forth. Right, and so, and the, also the reminder is you, sh you can never be a friend of a patient on Facebook, just putting that reminder out there. And they really should, you should not follow a patient if, if you're involved taking care of them. Just remember those things and you should be fine. Yes, and, and no identifying information in your tweets or on your Facebook. Profile. And trust me, patients will try to befriend you on Facebook. <laughs> I've had a few try that. Any more questions? So another thing that you might may or may not know, there's something called research agent, and you actually can file people's publications. Yes. So anyone here who's published any articles, you get on research agent, and people come and request your articles. I get a lot of requests on LinkedIn from people, and I don't really know what to do with it. I don't find it very helpful. I think that's mostly people looking for jobs. But the research agent, students and academics, is probably a nice way to interact with people, and then you can download and the articles you publish, you can put posters on there, and I think it'll be a useful thing for people to, if they're interested in academics, to consider that, that website. Sure, absolutely. Um, I wanted to touch, touch, talk about the uh, CME credit that we've been working on getting CME credit for three years, and there's one main reason why we'll never get CME credit for what we're doing, YouTube, and it's because of the number of views that we have. We have too many views. So the CME office is a major and a, a legitimate concern that they'll be overwhelmed by people requesting CME because of the numbers we have. So could you limit to a certain number of people who register? Limit to a certain number of people registered to register as a user you can get it that way? But then we'd have to control, so we thought about that too, we'd have to control how many people we'd allow to register. Because they only have a certain manpower in the office. And we don't want to block anyone from using our, our tool. Well I think the first thing you should do is get all the former residents registered. The doctors out in private practice, they don't have access to them. It's very hard. Get that. So they will be good to get credit. So that might be a starting point. Just have when residents and fellows leave this institution, they can be hooked up indefinitely because you don't have access to PubMed, and it's hard to get you know uh, a lot of CME. You may not up to date. You people don't have up to date. It costs a lot of money. So one thought is just at least have former residents involved, okay. and that'd be a way they can contact. It'd be a small number. At least get a start. Thank you, Sure. Thank you. Yes. Uh, when you call it to sell, are not receiving it. What number should them on the telephone? Is it my cell phone or is it just a generic out of state out of the call? It it will be your caller ID that shows up on the phone. Okay. So it depends on how you have your caller ID set up. If you have it set up to show nothing or show it as blocked, it'll come up as blocked. So when you're paging someone, uh, the yeah. number, the page number gets uh, put, put in automatically, and then you're putting a uh, num callback number. If you want to put a callback number as a different number, you can very well do that. You have, when you're paging, your number is not automatically going to go there on that page. So when I was an intern in 1971, we had pagers. They are still out of date. <laughs> Why don't you just have everyone's cell phone number in a system? And then you want to get a hold of someone, you text them. I mean, that's how I do with our fellows. That's the only way I can talk to my children. So I don't understand why I can pay you. <laughs> I wish I could have the funding to <laughs> our health administration authority to do that. I'm you a Twitter handle, Dr. Uh, no, seriously. <laughs> can't you just have every cell phone number? Instead of this little card that has all the page numbers, just use cell phone numbers. Everybody's got the cell phone. I don't understand it, to be honest with you. I mean, you just got to wait for a page. You send the message. So ironically, a lot of physicians, um, Particularly of our generation, don't want their pagers. Uh, they they only want to use their pagers. They don't want their cell phone to be open access for communication. That's been my um, experience. So I think we retire. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, happen eventually. The other issue is that depending on where you are in the hospital, you don't get the text until so after.
Thank you.